Here we go. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lucy Gray, and I'm the co-founder of this little professional uh, learning community. Uh, Actionable Innovations Conversations is the name of this um, event that we do every Friday, and Actionable Innovations is the name of our group. We are uh, a group of people who are interested in educational innovation. We range from um, administrators to teachers to entrepreneurs and we're slowly growing this group to kind of explore ideas and think about how we can work together. We do three, we do three things th theoretically. We, um, we talk about innovation through these conversations. We write about it in a publication and hopefully one day we will move into some consulting work. So if you're interested in getting more involved with us and joining our Slack group and that sort of thing, shoot me an email at Lucy at Lucy Gray Consulting and I'll send you more information. Um, today, we have one of our newest members with us and Dr. Marcy Klein is going to be talking about her, um, the, the business that she's co-founded with one of her children, her adult, um, adult children, and how that business uh, can be useful to you potentially with STEM and STEAM education efforts. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Marcy and she can tell you a little bit more about herself. And um, she'll talk for a little while and present some things and then we'll have Q&A at the end. So if you have any questions, you might wanna save it till then or put them in the chat and we can, um, we can tackle them at the end of her talk. So thanks for coming, Marcy. We're so glad to have you here. Thank you. Okay, so let me start by screen sharing. Um, hold on. Okay, can you see with a thumbs up? Yeah, okay. So I'm going to start from the beginning. And hello, I'll introduce myself in a moment, but I'll start with the name of what I'm going to talk about is Entrepreneurship, Innovation, and Community Centered Learning. Um, hold on. Yeah. Okay. I'll start with an introduction. Um, so my name, if you don't know me, is Marcy Klein. Um, I am actually a pediatrician and was a pediatrician for 20 years, quite happily, um, until my two kids, um, who are on the right, developed um, a STEM product that was just too good to just leave only in their own hands. And I joined forces with them and um, have started a company with them. So maybe somebody entered. Um, so just to give a little bit of background, my daughter, Ayana, took an architecture class as a high school student um, one summer at Columbia University and fell so much in love with architecture as an educational discipline that she developed an architecture modeling system for early learners. And what she loved so much about architecture was how it blended her passion, which are the arts and humanity and culture with um, some of her skill sets in um, math and science and technology. And she she thought that architecture blends them so well that it was worth um, using as an educational tool for early learners. At the time, my son, who was starting his freshman year, was getting into CAD and 3D printing. So she drafted out some designs, he 3D printed them, and um, that the rest is, um, is is, is history. We started a company with a 3D printer and some pieces of cardboard and um, a prototype. Um, so basically they came with this product, they didn't know what to do with it. And we set up a, a booth at a farmer's market and a local um, soccer tournament. And what I saw was just magical. Um, kids were playing with these connectors and cardboard shapes that were basically cut up Amazon boxes. Kids that didn't know each other were playing together. Kids of all different ages were playing together. Parents were actually sitting on our little Ikea uh, tables and playing with their children. And what was incredible to me was that there was not one piece of electronics um, in the booth. Um, and as a pediatrician, um, watching the transition from kids playing with their hands to everything on an iPad, it was it was like magic to me to watch this um, unfold. And that was the birth of Three Ducks. 
Um, so my kids developed the, product, uh, the products, which you see on the left. And over the last four years, I've been creating curriculum and content for, um, to just augment the use of the products, both in the home and in the classroom. Um, so the entrepreneurial journey for my children is incredible. Um, it started from, you know, literally 3D printing connectors and packaging, um, a mom and pop packaging design from our dining room to having a complete factory, which you see on the upper left, um, and a whole packaging facility. And we don't manufacture everything, but we do um, a lot of products in-house. Um, my daughter learning CAD and rendering programs, um, both of them, um, what was the most incredible part of their journey is their ability to just overcome the challenges of starting a company and um, also the ability to share their ideas and their mission and do presentations and get up on a stage and talk about what they're passionate about um, has been an incredible opportunity for me to watch um, my own children and been some of the inspiration behind a lot of the lesson plans and challenges that I create, just how I've seen my own kids grow through this journey. Um, unfortunately, that's not all that goes into entrepreneurship. Um, this is just a short list of all of the things that we've had to learn how to um, learn how to manage and, and tackle as entrepreneurs that are starting a company. Um, keep in mind, I'm a pediatrician. I've never taken a business class in my life. Um, and I, nobody in our company had an engineering degree, an architecture degree, and two out of the three of us didn't even have a high school degree. Um, but somehow we managed to master all of these tasks and come up with a business model that was scalable. Um, so why did I leave pediatrics, this nice, comfortable life, um, to start a company? Um, well, as I said, watching kids play with the product was so magical. It was like it couldn't happen. Um, so why do I love cardboard as a modeling system so much? Um, for starters, it's absolutely incredibly fun. There's not one person, I don't think, on this earth that doesn't love playing and being creative with cardboard. Um, but more academically, it improves 3D spatial thinking, fine motor, um, fine motor um, lots of STEM in there, obviously. But we also include literacy in all of our projects, as well as all the 21st century skills. So creativity, um, critical problem solving, uh, collaboration, um, and communication are um, all skills that students learn using our projects and curriculum. Um, to me, the most important component um, is empathy. We build empathy into all of the projects. So students really have to think about other people and how they live their life and their needs before they design solutions for them. Why I love architecture and urban design so much as a platform for learning is, um, and I alluded to it when my daughter took the architecture class, um, architecture and urban design really blend um, the sciences and the maths with arts and humanity, but what they also do is they bring in humanity and the natural environment as well. Um, so it's really a completely 100% holistic learning experience that crosses all disciplines. And it's like bringing the outside world into the classroom. So students um, get to experience real world problems that they see in the world outside, and then they come into the classroom to design solutions for them. Um, and the variety of projects that we get is so incredible. So students actually on our student showcase can even learn from each other. Um, so to the right is just an example of some of the projects that were done from around the world and how you can see even through cardboard construction, so much culture comes out of these projects. You almost feel like you're living in that community and you know what it's like to live there. Um, so to some of our lesson plans and challenges that I'll go over, um, thanks to COVID, um, we have a lot of online content that's family facing. So for kids playing at home, not so academic, but, you know, want, we incorporate some engineering and some math and some light learning into really fun, playful projects that are family centered. So parents don't need an education degree to play with their kids and do these projects with them. They don't even realize that they're science topics that they're teaching. They think they're just playing with their kids. 
Um, for the classroom, we have a ton of individual lesson plans that are more like one to two or one to three hour projects that are standards aligned. Um, so kids can use them, you, you can, teachers can use them in the classroom, the maker space, or even in after school programs. Um, but what I'm really the most passionate about, our most recent, recent development is our Global Futures Design Lab. Um, and this is a full curriculum where students essentially build an entire community from the ground up. Um, so it starts with two components. There's the core challenge, which is in essence, students starting with a community center and building a community center, um, but they have to explore the strengths and the needs of their own community before they can design it. So it's not just like build a community center, but they really have to do a lot of investigating of what their community is really about um, and then design the community center based on what they learned. And then we have a ton of um, extensions or optional side quests. And those are individual lessons that can be added onto the core program, totally optional. And they're based um, either on student interest, grade level, or on the learning goals of the teacher. So different side quests have different academic goals. Um, so they can be divided that way as well. All of our projects focus on design thinking. Um, so if anyone isn't familiar with it, um, they start by um, imagining and understanding what the problem and uh, really going through the ideation process, really getting an understanding of, of what the challenge is. Um, and that's and during the Global Futures program, we also introduce them to the core challenge. Um, then they go through the design process, exploding all the different possibilities of um, what they can build and then honing in and coming up with um, a more specific solution that they plan to prototype and, and build out. Um, the next phase is building where they construct their projects and create a final layout working together. And then the end is um, which doesn't have to be the end in the design process. It's kind of almost like the beginning, phase one, because you go back around again, um, but sharing and creating a real um, presentation, a multimedia presentation um, that students can share in a number of ways that I'll go over. Um, in general, we start the program by really having an understanding of what is community, and we expand the concept of community um, to not just the people and the very small geographic community in which they live, but a larger community. So the environment, the built structures, and also all of the living things that are part of the community. Um, the community, by the way, can be the student's own local community, but it could also be tied to civics lessons. So if people are studying um, a community somewhere else, it can easily be that community as well that the students can work on. Um, the core project, again, is building a community center um, that supports the needs of everybody in that community. Um, and in this example, I'm just going to run through some examples of projects that have been done in schools. Um, it can start with a site visit. So these students went to the actual location where they were going to build their community center. Um, and they did some um, you know, on-site research. And then they came back to the classroom and they started the ideation and design process as a bigger group. Um, they also can look into site maps. So this is a Google map of the area and they'll get a really good understanding of what the community has already and what the needs are of the community and learn a little bit about the geography of that area that they're gonna be building their, their structures on. Um, here is another example of um, how you can bring in real research on the history of that community, getting a real understanding of, of how the, that community started, where it came from, and what it's like now. Um, and here's an example from our community, Bridgeport, Connecticut. Um, this site where these students did their project was on the old General Electric facility, which in the 1950s was this beautiful 3 million square foot structure. And it's basically an eyesore in the middle of Bridgeport um, as it stands today. So this is the area where one group of students chose to put their community center. Um, so there's a lot of exploration and, um, and research that goes into the design process. 
um, these students broke up into a number of teams. Um, this is just an example of some of the teams that students can come up with. It really depends on their own objectives and, and, and the group that's working on that project. So there's a lot of room for creativity here and um, critical problem solving and identifying problems that exist in their community. Um, students will go on to building, drafting, um, designing their projects, and then ultimately building their structures. And then they go on to um, creating a full assembly. Um, so individual groups will get together and create one final layout for the whole center. And our favorite part is presentation day. Um, so students, oops, let me go back. Students sorry, can do a bunch of different types of presentation. Um, it can be um, just amongst their peers in their classroom, a live presentation, but it's also an opportunity for a lot of multimedia, um, like technology, um, using videography, using photography, using creative storytelling. So there's a lot of room for creativity and um, bringing in some technology into the presentation phase. Um, side quests are optional extensions to the core program, so it really depends on how long students have to work on their project and how much fun they're having and what they want to do next. Um, the side quests range from um, residential areas with our tiny house challenge to engineering challenges with design a zoo. And I'll share a couple of examples of a few of them. Um, here is our design a zoo, um, sorry, design a bridge challenge. So, um, you know, most kids that do this typical engineering activity where they're designing a bridge and they go over the different types of bridges and then they do some experimenting with different weights and loads is one way to do a bridge challenge. But in this case, these students decided that they weren't going to do a typical bridge for um, cars, but they wanted to identify the problem in their own community. And this particular area was um, the Trans-Canadian Highway, where they found um, there's more animal injuries than there are human injuries. So here's a, a way that they included technology into their storytelling. So this group included a stop motion video um, as a way of really creatively sharing their story of animal carnage um, on the side of the highway. Um, and then they go into, you know, their typical engineering challenge, um, you know, the standards aligned engineering contents. And then they can create an entire story um, with photography and um, a written presentation. And in addition to the technology and the videography that they did in their storytelling component. Um, our tiny house challenge, um, another side quest, this one a little less on engineering and more focused on um, geometry, understanding scale and some financial literacy as students um, figure out the area, the volume, and the cost of making their homes. Um, and here's an example of a home from Thailand on the river where you can see so much of their community comes out of their builds um, from seeing that it's a riverfront property, so their houses are elevated to the bamboo thatch of the construction of their homes. Um, and in the picture on the left, you can see a little boat with vegetables. Their market in this town is actually a floating market. So you get so much of their culture from their builds. And that is as opposed to these buildings, which are um, the first one is a hanging hut in the middle of a forest that's designed to be in keeping with the, the, the forest and not um, cause any damage to the forest itself. The middle picture is a crowded, tiny New York City apartment. And the picture on the right is an example of some space saving innovations with a rooftop garden. Um, other projects that are extensions build a landmark, include some culture and civics um, applications in there. And we have a getting down to business project where students make their own um, main street and they open up their own stores. So there's a lot of entrepreneurship. And again, um, 
creating a business plan, marketing, financial literacy, all part of this project. The modern zoo kids love, um, it includes life science, but also engineering simple machines for each one of the zoo enclosures and um, sustainability. So this class was really interesting. It was a very small school in Costa Rica. The kindergarteners actually created the village and then the fifth graders came in and they came up with some solutions for how to make it more environmentally friendly. So it's a great chance for um, different grades to work on a project and really work together. Um, putting it all together, I'm going to show you an example of what a project could look like. And this is based on um, the project from Bridgeport, Connecticut. Looking at an aerial view of the site, Steel Point Harbor is a waterfront property with an adjacent uninhabited island. It is close to the Bridgeport Ferry, University of Bridgeport, a Bass Pro Shop, a Starbucks, and a Chipotle. It is also right near this awesome new education company called Three Ducks Design. Before building our model, we created a site map with paper and post-its to lay out the space and buildings. We divided it into focus teams, each responsible for a different aspect of the job. Our teams included economic growth, education, recreation, cultural diversity and equity, and the environment. This is our design. Starting with the island, we designed it as zero waste recreation area with a hotel, a farm-to-table restaurant, an ice cream shop, and a lighthouse museum. The entire island is designed to bring visitors and money to the community. It is 100% owned and run by the people of Bridgeport, supplying new jobs. Our team opted for the sustainable feature side quest and learned how to run the island entirely on wind and solar power. To celebrate cultural diversity, we designed a live performance and recreation center where locals could share their music, their culture, and have fun entertaining visitors. We believe that understanding and celebrating what makes us unique will foster a better sense of community and equity for the next generation. No stage is complete without multicolored LED lighting and super modern seating, of course. The next part of our development is a before and after school center, perfect for working parents. It has a makerspace, a gymnasium, and a greenhouse, where kids learn gardening and grow the food that supplies the Seaview Hotel with farm fresh produce. The adjacent community forest includes a pond with the water feature, a swing set made from upcycled materials, and a meadow with a treehouse, home to wild animals and the cows that supply the island ice cream shop with fresh ingredients. Next is the Adult Education Center. Many people in this community do not complete high school or college, so this is a perfect place for them to learn new skills. It has a library, an outdoor cafe, and an entrepreneurship innovation lab. There's a small business counseling service. Adults can broaden their skill set to join the workforce, get counseling on starting a business, and use the innovation lab to design and prototype their new ideas. The adjacent startup alley is a line of pop-up shops that entrepreneurs can rent by the month to market test their startup ideas with real customers at low risk. This beautiful seaside oasis is designed to give locals a place to enjoy, to learn, to socialize, to work, and most of all, to take pride in their city. With a flourishing visitor center and influx of money to the city, this can be just the beginning. Thank you for listening, and we hope you like our proposal. If accepted, we would be happy to break ground today. So um, in terms of our team, um, we have a ton of people from all over the world, um, all different types of professions that have um, helped support us either um, directly or through creating design challenges or working with us on some of these design challenges. So a lot of our engineering and our architecture um, projects were inspired and co-created with people that are actually working in the fields, which is really um, a fun addition to these design challenges to actually hear the voice of somebody who, want, you know, who does these professions. Um, we also have a ton of students um, as a part of our team. So interns, um, kids, we have a little ambassador from Kenya who does lesson plans with his community based on our products. And then we also have a number of authors. We do um, collaborative kit with books um, for some of our projects as well. So there's a lot of literacy um, in a lot of our projects. Um, but most 
fun is the student showcase where those students that complete projects have an opportunity to submit them and put them on our website. And that just adds a whole new level of empowerment and pride for the students because they see their projects up there um, with other projects from kids around the world. They can explore each other's projects and learn about each other's communities, but they also feel like they have a voice that their project didn't end at the presentation in the classroom, but it will live on forever for other people in a wider audience to see their ideas and their visions. So that's a really fun component of our, um, of our platform. And lastly, um, our goal for the future is to create um, live um, expos and presentations of all of the students' projects each year. Um, so that's hopefully in the works in the future. We'll see how it goes. Um, so that is the end of my presentation. Um, so I am happy to chat, answer questions. Um, yeah, I, I have a couple observations. One is um, I'm really intrigued by the idea of, of kids having input into the design of their learning environments. And one school I visited a long time ago in Singapore um, was an Emilio Reggio based um, I want to say it was a K to five school. It was, it wasn't just preschool and mm -hmm. the kids had, um, you know, I am, I'm not sure if they actually designed anything, but they, they said that they wanted like a disco, a jungle and a pirate ship you know, different <laughs> groups of kids in their library. So they actually put all those elements into their library. And then the kids, um, and parents painted a mural that was inspired by Keith Haring that kind of encapsulated their hopes and dreams for this new school and then there were all sorts of different elements like that where the where the where the community had input into the school so i'm wondering have you have you have you seen architects or or school planners take your kits and use them um in the process of of, of learning about a school as they're designing for them not yet um but that is something very much that we're interested in um my daughter actually who's graduating um, this year is going to be applying hopefully to a few architecture firms um, that are larger with this type of initiative. And she would wanna be the person that implements it and works on the team. Um, so that would be like a really easier segue because then we'd have somebody like yeah, yeah. on their team, um, the architecture firm that she wants to do that with is um, was actually just on 60 Minutes like three weeks ago. So they probably have like a gazillion applications for people that want to work there, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, but yes, I mean, that's a really important goal for us. It's a little hard it's hard as a startup company to like get in there before someone's actually built a school and say, hey, how about the student voice? Um, but in my mind, um, not just in a school, but in the community at large, like any community that's starting an initiative, if they can get buy-in and feedback from the students, I mean, they're the ones that are gonna be the adults in the community right. in the future. Like if you felt like you were part of designing a park, are you really gonna throw garbage on the ground? You know, like that's yours. So like you, you were part of it, you made it. Like you're gonna respect it and you're gonna be proud of it and you're gonna feel ownership. And when these kids get older, that's how they'll feel about their communities if their voice was heard and they were a part of the discussion. Um, even if it's not exactly the way they envisioned it with like a spaceship, you know? Yeah. But if they if they felt like their, their ideas were heard and were a part of the building of that component, um, I feel like there'd be so much more ownership and pride in community in the future. Yeah. So that is definitely something that we would love to incorporate. It's just a matter of, getting in at the you know at the first start yeah. of all those projects uh somebody to ask about that is amy yurko who's one of our group members she's not here today but she's a school planner and oh yeah uh, she and i've done workshops together a long time ago she's trained as an architect but also as a school planner which is kind of the liaison between the school and the architect team Cool. And um, and there's a professional association of school planners that does workshops and professional development for that group. So she might be a good resource for you. Um, for sure. I, see, I see that um, that uh, Alex had a comment. Alex, do you want to do you want to talk about your observation? 
Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. One of the things I was looking at it um, from the perspective of is the really in an, in an elementary classroom of getting the students to build and define their spaces and understand, okay, so I'm building a house, I'm building you know, a school, I'm building all that. And then the ability for them to tactile go from this is a school and then learn in a different language that they're doing to be able to, you know, really grow with, with their language so that there's a physical, like when, as you're trying to go through, it's no longer an abstract learning a second language or doing anything else. It's as I'm building something, as I'm putting it next to the river, I can, you know, name the river in the second language or vice versa. So you could actually do a, a geographically remote lesson where kids build their um, villages and their areas, and then they could actually teach each other the words and the languages for Absolutely. the situation. Like I just, uh, being in a network of large of schools, it's international, like we're doing a little bit of that with Minecraft now, but that physical tactile component is so, such a huge factor in terms of getting them to grasp and be able to play with it and, and understand it. Yeah, actually, the um, the picture that I shared from the Costa Rica school is a bilingual school. So I don't know. I kind of went through the slides quickly. There's like so many opportunities with the product. But that school, actually, the um, the names on all of the buildings were in Spanish. So it was really mm -hmm. cute. Um, and I reckon, I mean, they're kindergartners, but I was able and I took French. So it was like doubly hard. But um, I was able to see like, you know, Mi Casa and like Escuela. And so, yeah, it could be a really fun project like so other students even that have done the similar community project getting on our website and looking at the Spanish um, the Costa Rican project will like be able to practice and look and see like oh that's like the, oh that's their school you know <laughs> or so it is interesting so yeah you could definitely involve language in there but it's also a good chance for um, for students learning language like around the structures and geography in their home too. So mm -hmm. if they're doing a waterfront project, like learning the geography around waterfront properties and the terms that are part of that are, are also, um, you know, an opportunity even within their own language. Mm -hmm. um, we have a comment from Manny uh, or Mani. Mani, um, are you able to, uh, are you, can you show the slide that show the different aspects of bringing the startup to life? Um, the one with that showed the design, business plan, marketing, production, etc. Oh, you want me to put that back on? Yeah. Okay. And Ma Mani, do you have a, a, a particular question related to it? Let me see. It's all the way at the beginning. So this was like our journey. Um, can you guys see that, or should yeah. I make it? Like, yeah, there? we can see it. So this is like just like one small family startups journey and all of the skills that we had to learn, um, but they'll look completely different based on like a different company and what what they make. So, I mean, if you're making an app, you probably don't need 3D modeling and a CNC router and a 3D printer. And to learn how to do CAD, you'll need coding. Um, so these are just the skills and I literally just like I didn't take notes on this. I was just thinking through our journey for four years and all of the things that we learned. And as a, as a company of three people, um, we had to divide and conquer these. So like I do photography and my daughter does the 3D rendering. I do the graphic design. My son does the CAD. Um, so it's, you know, but, but we all have lift. to do all of it. What? It's a heavy lift. I mean, to actually, I mean, it's one thing to have an idea. It's another thing to actually produce it. And, and then sell it. Yes, yes. Yeah. And, and I, I get flummoxed. I mean, just thinking about even for me, thinking about how people put a restaurant together. Like, where do you get all the stuff? And how do you get all yeah. your food? And how do you know how much food to order? I mean, uh, you know, any kind of business is, is particularly complex. Um, but this is this is interesting how you 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 break it up. My question for you related to this is, who actually makes your product? How did how did you yeah find a company to to create it or to prototype it and then it's, to actually make it? 
it's so it's literally our company started out with um, one 3D printer and we actually had a workshop because I used to make furniture. So we had a CNC router. That's like a whole other like hour talk about my failed company making furniture. But we had a workshop in Bridgeport and we had a CNC router and we had a 3D printer. So they used the tools that we had. And, you know, my, my son was starting high school. So my husband's like, this is a good time for him to learn CAD. Like, We'll, we'll do it together. So he learned those skills. Um, so we started out by 3D printing and literally cutting one piece of cardboard at a time on a CNC router table. And that got us through the first three months. And then people started buying. And I'm like, you know, this is cool, but it takes 25 minutes to make one kit. Um, it's not sustainable. So, you know, we looked into all the different ways that you can cut cardboard. And what we came up with was like a $12,000 secondhand die cutter and made dies so that we could cut all the pieces out. And then we still had to hand pack them. Um, and then after like six months, we were up to three, four 3D printers going 24 hours a day. And my husband's and my son's model was like, we're going to just start a printer farm. But by the time you get to four printers, you're like, two of them are not working at any given time. And 50% of my life is fixing the printer. <laughs> and when you have a order for 400 connectors that go in one classroom kit, like it takes 24 hours to make that. So that didn't work. So it was either find a new husband or find a new manufacturing method. And since I look kind of like my husband's, yeah. So in the end, I literally like Googled puzzle maker um, and I wound up making a phone call to what wound up being the largest toy manufacturer that's on seven, I don't know how many continents, five continents I think they're on. And they called me back. They're like, do you know who we are? I'm like, well, you're on Google. You were first. They're like, well, you know, we make Minot like we make everything like we make every game you've ever played like that's who we are wow. and I think you're a little small for us but I saw you're about us I love your mission I actually like your product and why don't you and the kids come for a tour so we got a tour um it was the coolest it was like being on how it's made it's like a million square foot facility it's only an hour away from us so it was miraculous that their manufacturing is right near us and they're like, we know you're not ready yet, but when you're ready, call us. And it wound up not being the cardboard shapes yet, but we started with the connectors because that was like our pain point. And we got to the point where we're like, my kids did a Kickstarter campaign that paid for like half of the injection molds. And we invested, we came up with a business model and depreciation. It was a whole learning experience. Of like, how do you, you know, pay for this? And we got the injection mold done. So now we can get like 500, a million, you know, connectors in three, four weeks. Wow. Um, and then a year later, once we started really making a lot of school sales as opposed to retail sales, the amount of cardboard we needed was enough to scale again. So now they make our cardboard in sheets and they make our connectors, but we package in-house because I, we like making different kits. So we take the same raw materials and we package them, you know, with LED lighting or with like pulley systems or depending on the lesson and the product. Oh, cool. So we're still not like completely like monopoly, like mass produced and shipped to, oh, you know, like we put our hands on it at the end. Um, but that would be the next step when we're ready to like, you know, get like 20,000 of them. We're not there yet. I wonder if there's a, a connection between being a doctor and being a furniture maker, because <laughs> I, have no. a friend, I have a friend <laughs> whose husband is an anesthesiologist and he makes furniture in um, right. amazing, amazing furniture. And she, no, actually, like she works <laughs> at an, an Amelia Reggio school um, in St. Louis. And this is a friend who I was visiting oh. in St. Louis, how I was telling you about and um, she works at the college school in St. Louis. And this is something that her, I think her students would really like this. So I'm going to send her this recording when we're done. Um, but sure. here's the other question I have for you. Since you have a global reach um, and involvement in your community, um, are, do you have lessons that are on your, what, all the lessons on your website, I assume are free. 
um, correct me if I'm wrong, and are any of them aligned to teaching about the UN Sustainable Development Goals by chance? Yeah, so almost all of our side quests are based on some type of, I mean, I don't know, they're not all, I guess they're not all based on a sustainable development goal, but they really can tie into it quite easily. Um, so our tiny house challenge is about small space living and sustainability and making innovations for small space living. Um, our sustainable, you know, energy one with renewable energy and our circuits and all that talk about renewable energy. Um, so a lot of our lesson plans are tied because, and it's not really necessarily done because of the UN sustainable development goals. It's about my vision for what the world needs. <laughs> Um, so, and it just happens to be very much aligned with the needs of the world. So, um, a lot of stuff on diversity and equity, um, is woven into the lessons, but it's not like, an, it's not like you get hit over the head with it. Like it's much more subtle. Um, and it's based on the students exploring a problem and realizing that that problem exists. So like they can design a playground, um, like they need to understand in their community that there are children that can't get on that playground because they can't walk up steps. So it's for them to figure that out um, through the design process and understanding what the community needs are. So they're all woven in um, to the lesson plans, but they're just not, you know, it's not like, okay, you have to design this playground for someone in a wheelchair. It's more about them being open to that and discovering that themselves and then designing it with that in mind. And the same thing like with the zoo challenge, like they have to understand the animal's life in the natural environment and what their needs are before they can design a zoo enclosure for that animal um, that makes it feel like it's at home and is happy and healthy. So it's, it, we don't tell them they have to do that, but they have to understand that through understanding what the animal's life is like for the design process. So, so a couple of other things I'm thinking about. It would be nice. It would. I would. I don't know what your next things are that you want to do. Um, it would be fun to have an app that went with this that was like a, like a planner before they built, like a like a I don't know some sort of kind of. Like scrum? <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe a, 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 it could be a scrum thing. Or I'm thinking actually of a visual like grid where the kids could plot out where things are going to go. I think that would be sure. Kind of, and they can, you know, I mean, we could do an app. I mean, my feeling um, is that like there's no reason for us to reinvent things that already exist in this world yeah. because somebody like Minecraft has already done that for us. So all we need to do is say, why don't you lay it out on Minecraft or, That's a good um, idea. you know, so, you know, we're trying to be as lean as we can and add content where we feel like it's lacking in this world. So like people are like, why don't you put robotics? Why don't you make a robot? I'm like, why am I going to make a robot? There's like 40 robots out there. Like take your Azaba and you yeah, pop it in the I middle saw of that. Yeah. yeah. And then, so we'll create content for a robot but we're not going to make the robot, if that makes sense. Yeah, that totally makes sense. Here's the other thing. Um, and maybe Julian can speak to this too. Um, Apple started a model of project-based learning a number of years ago called challenge-based learning. And they kind of mm -hmm. gave it over to Digital Promise. And maybe it's back at Apple. I don't know what the story is there. But Julian, do you want to talk a little bit about challenge-based learning and how this mirrors that? Yeah, so it has a lot of the design thinking aspect in it, and they've applied it with coding even, and so I love what, what you're doing. It really puts the kids in charge, uh, and, and it's much like, you know, PBL, project-based learning, but it's it's different in some ways, but I think the main pro, um, premise is that you don't, pick the, you don't pick the issue they're working on. The kids find a problem, and they address mm -hmm. that problem. Uh, and so they address it and they'll use their de design thinking strategies to try to, to figure out how to solve it. Uh, I did a big initiative with Apple down in, in Austin and it was at several places that they've continued. It was about coding, you involved coding too, and they never coded to do it. But what they did, they went through the process of thinking, you know, if we were to build an app to resolve this or whatever we're doing, 
and they'd even just draw it out. It could be drawn out right. visually or on poster board. What would we need? What does an app have? And I look at this, what do I need? And how do I design it? So they flow sure. uh, But they took it even further by bringing in people from the community mm -hmm. to come in so um, and kind of do a pitch on what, what they needed for an app to support them for the greater good. So things like one was um, a local Ronald McDonald house that um, needed an app to connect families when they're all there so they can find out what restaurants to go to while their children are having like um, cancer treatment or something and kind of have that community feeling. Uh, another idea they came up with, and this was after the hurricanes in Texas, was an app to help identify dogs uh, and cats, pets, not yeah. just dogs cats, but pets, uh, and connect them and put them different places and foster them and to find your pet and all that type of thing. So. There are lots of uh, things in the community that came in and then they got in their teams and they brainstormed solutions. So you can also go from that aspect, you know, either you let the kids in CBL, you're letting the kids pick what their problem is uh, yeah. and it, it, the entire design thinking process. And um, also the action piece is really with CBL, the, the yeah, action the piece next is really piece important. Is that you have to go, then it's not, to, and that's the, the differentiator, I think it's that you, are really, and we did this a lot with um, Digital Promise and the New Media Consortium when they were involved in it and all of that. And it's that they're going to take action. It's not just some theoretical thing, but right. they're going to come up with a plan to actually take action for what they're doing. Are they going to build the app? Are they going to um, make a difference in climate or something? Whatever it is sure. they've decided. So, what are the things they're going to do? And then it involves the technology too sometimes. You know, how can you use technology to bring people together? and and all that so it's, it's a it's a but it's a design thinking process at the end of this one it was like a shark tank they all came back the community members came back and they did their pitch mm -hmm. um to show them and actually one of the organizations developed they developed an app the kid you know some developed the app for that organization they went on and got kids to help develop it so oh, that's uh, great. It, yeah so but i think the design thinking process is huge and then cbl you know it's i think the difference like i was saying is that it's problems you can't give them the problem because they're not going to have ownership of it they have to have ownership so they I didn't it could be how do I change the food in my cafeteria it could be anything yeah or it could be as big as how do I stop climate change so and, and that's our goal with the side quests like over time um is like as you know we have like a teacher in Oklahoma who's like I want to do a like a racetrack I'm like you own it you know you create yeah. it like we'll yeah. put it on our website and then kids can do like the racetrack yeah. side quest. Yeah. So that's kind of why we divided it up in side quests. So they're like topic. It's like, you know, a teacher might need to teach like, you know, the geometry, like she might want that in a tiny house challenge or so it fulfills some standards if she wants or need he or she or they, sorry, they want it. Um, so it's available, but we try to keep as much room for, um, open endedness even within the tiny house challenge. Exactly. And, so, and one thing you said there was important is standards because when we've done this in, in Frisco, Texas, we did several with Frisco, Texas school districts. Um, and this was separate, a separate initiative. It wasn't about coding at all. It was just teaching CBL and working with them as CBL. And the first thing they always said was, what about the TEKS, which are the Texas education standards? Right. Um, and so trying to help them understand that it can even make your your standards, uh, the understanding and the growth more, you know, a deeper understanding, something that's really important and connects and authentic and real world and all that. But it's just um, getting through those first phases of understanding it. And Lucy, as you know, we were all lost the first time we did it <laughs> as ADEs. Wait, there's no script. There's no way to get an A. I don't take a test and check off these boxes. So um, sure. It does, yeah. it does kind of leave you with some ambiguity that's uncomfortable for some students and for some teachers. Yeah, so it's, it's tough for a balance. Um, you know, we have another curriculum that it, like we haven't really implemented it that much because we launched it right before COVID and it's called Creating Communities and it, it's actually scaffolded. So like out of the four components of it, part one is super like titrated. Like this is, it's a, it's a, like a recipe for the lesson, but as you go through each level of, um, there's four different components by the fourth module, it's like, okay, go do it on your own. 
now finds a problem in your community. So it goes from like really easy for the teacher to like a little uncomfortable because there's a little bit of loosey goosey in there. And then the third one is like a game base. Like we give them a community with already problems in there that they had to solve. Mm -hmm. And then they learn those skills of solving community problems and teamwork. And then they go and like the last one is like just a capstone project, go in your community. Yeah. And you yeah. don't have to boil the ocean at first or something tiny and start with something percolated and maybe you are kind of stripping it at first. Yeah. You know, so getting them comfortable in whatever way is, is good. The good thing is it's really hard with, with cardboard modeling to take the creativity out of the kids' projects. So even if you give you. them, <laughs> you know, they're going to do their own thing. Like I did a workshop for eight week program with eight kindergarten boys and like it was build a community and like the week one, every single building was a Tesla dealership. And I'm like, guys, like, don't you want to sleep somewhere? <laughs> you know, like we have to like, we have to broaden our concept a little bit. The life does not revolve around the Tesla, but it took them like over the eight weeks, then they started building. So it took a little bit of goading, but then they had like a full community in the end, but there was so much room for them to like enjoy it and take ownership of it. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Great conversation, everyone. Um, I love this. And this really gives me, um, this is a really great overview of what you do, Marcy, and how your company came to be. And um, it's it's I love how your your children are involved, and 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 how creative it is. And um, there's so much potential there. So for those of you who just joined us, um, I'm going to put the link to her website in the chat so you can check it out. I will post the recording of this and the transcript over the weekend and send it to everybody who's registered. Um, right. But this has been really terrific. And, and if, does anybody else have any other com any comments for us or questions before we go? All right. Um, it looks like we're, we're on, uh, some people have uh, moseyed on uh, to other things, but um, this has been really great, Marcy. And we have another for-profit person who has joined our ranks and hopefully we'll get her to talk about her story. Her okay. name is Paula Jackson. She works for Barefoot Books, which is in Boston, which um, has an early childhood emphasis. Mm -hmm. And I know Paula because she had a, um, a nonprofit video um, thing for kids called Kidify. And I helped her kind of connect with people to see if she could grow it into something a number of years ago and mm -hmm. she recently moved to boston and is working for barefoot books and i invited her to join us because i think i think that there's i think one thing that's kind of missing from education are conversations too between entrepreneurs and companies and and educators and i think educators tend to be a little wary of people who are doing things in the for-profit mode and I think there's actually room for collaboration and discussion and, and learning from each other. So we're really happy to have you as part of Actionable Innovations and Paula as well. And we'll have more conversations going forward. Um, yeah, after, after Thanksgiving, hopefully I'll have some more people lined up for us to talk to. Right now, I don't have anything on the schedule, but that's my next thing to work on over the weekend is to schedule um, people to, to share their work with us um, during December. So that's my plan. Any final words for us, Marcy? Um, no, I don't think so. I think I talked enough. <laughs> well, we're so glad to have you here. Thank you so much for your time. It's been a really great session. Thanks again. Yeah.